Welcome to NTD News, I'm Kevin Hogan. Here are today's top stories. The largest fuel pipeline in the U.S. restarting some operations after a ransomware attack. When does it expect to be back up and running? A group of citizens in Arizona files a lawsuit alleging that the state's elections are out of compliance with the law. They want the state's Supreme Court to take drastic action. We'll tell you what they're seeking. Facebook criticized for its decision to uphold its ban on former President Trump. Some of the critics include a Democrat senator and a member of Facebook's oversight board. A close encounter between U.S. and Iranian ships. An American Coast Guard vessel fires over two dozen warning shots after 13 Iranian ships get a little too aggressive. An independent news outlet in Hong Kong says Beijing's grip is tightening. In just a month, the paper and one of its reporters both suffered attacks. They suspect the Chinese Communist regime is behind it. Colonial Pipeline says one of its lines is operating under manual control for now. An expert says if it can resume operations by the end of this week, widespread problems can be averted. NTD's Jessica Beatty has the details. A cyber attack on the largest U.S. pipeline is sending ripples across the economy. The Colonial Pipeline delivers about half the fuel used on the eastern seaboard. It shut down Friday after a ransomware attack by a group called DarkSide. We believe that the source is probably in an uh, area of uh, Russia. We're not sure right now. Depending on how long the shutdown lasts, it could impact millions of consumers. The U.S. issued a rare emergency declaration Sunday to set up alternative fuel routes. Colonial says it'll probably be up by the end of the week. It's unlikely we're going to have any widespread shortages. If this were to last more than five to ten days, yeah, then gas prices would really spike. The attack could be a wake-up call for the oil and gas industry. I think we should be thankful that, that it wasn't worse. And uh, I, I truly believe, you know, the focus is, is going to be laser focused now on uh, cybersecurity if it wasn't already. Darkside claims it isn't political and only wants to make money, but is not out to cause problems for society. Colonial said when it heard about the ransomware attack, it took some systems offline to contain the problem. Almost nothing is 100 percent secure, but you can be cyber secure at nine o'clock in the morning. But somebody clicks on the wrong link at 9.01 and suddenly you have ransomware in your systems. It's unclear how the hackers breached Colonial System. Levin says it could have something to do with remote working. And when you have remote connections, you have all sorts of vulnerabilities, not to mention the fact that so many people are so distracted based on managing life in general. It's as I always say, we have day jobs. But to hackers, we are their day job. Colonial says one section from North Carolina to Maryland is now operating under manual control until inventory runs out. But the main lines are still down. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy says the vote on potentially ousting Liz Cheney will happen on May 12th. She is currently serving as the House GOP conference chair. McCarthy also endorsed Congresswoman Elise Stefanik for the position. Cheney has been under fire for questioning Republicans' messaging and strategy to court voters. She also voted to impeach Trump during his second impeachment trial and has continued to criticize him since. Some Republicans have accused her of caving into the Democrats. House Republicans have said Cheney's comments to the media have hurt Republican efforts to unify before the 2022 elections. A group of citizens in Arizona say their state's elections do not comply with federal and state law and haven't since at least 2018. They want the Arizona Supreme Court to remove some state election officials from office. A group of 20 citizens filed a lawsuit with the Arizona Supreme Court alleging that the state's elections are invalid. They're asking the court to remove certain elected office holders and temporarily appoint the citizens who filed the suit to hold the offices until legal elections are held. The suit claims the companies Arizona used to certify election equipment were not accredited. Accreditation is through a federal agency and is valid for two years. The Citizens Group says the company's accreditation expired in 2017, so they couldn't legally certify the state's election equipment. 
Jerome Lovato is the certification director from the federal agency that oversees the companies. He released a memo on January 27th of this year saying that the companies are in good standing. He says the accreditation was delayed because of COVID-19. January 27th is the same day that the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors voted to audit election equipment. That audit used those same unaccredited vendors who did not report any issues with the election equipment. The Arizona Senate is in the process of conducting another separate audit of the 2020 election in Maricopa County. Arizona passed a new gun rights law. It deems gun stores essential businesses that can stay open in an emergency. The law also protects gun stores and gun manufacturers from lawsuits from the state, and it shields them from liability if people misuse their guns. Governor Doug Ducey signed the bill into law. He says the state isn't going to let lawsuits take away the constitutional rights of law-abiding citizens. Gun rights advocates praise the new law. They say it protects the rights of Arizona citizens. This comes as President Biden and Democrats in Congress promote a series of gun control proposals. They want to increase background checks and ban certain guns in high-capacity magazines. A Texas couple finds five unaccompanied minors left abandoned overnight on their farm near a river along the U.S.-Mexico border. The woman who discovered them said in a Facebook post that they were dumped like trash and that they were left on the land alone overnight with no food or water. The couple alerted local authorities, who then called Border Patrol agents, Border Patrol later revealed that all five children were girls. Three of the children were seven, three, and two years old from Honduras. The two youngest children were Guatemalan nationals, just five and 11 months old. Border Patrol said that they didn't need medical attention and will eventually end up in the custody of the Health and Human Services Department. Democrat Senator Elizabeth Warren criticized Facebook's decision to uphold its ban on former President Trump. Warren says the social media giant has become too powerful and should be broken up. Here are the details. Even though Senator Elizabeth Warren is glad Trump is banned from Facebook, she still considers the social media giant's move worrying. Warren told Cheddar News, I'm glad he's not on Facebook, but I don't think that Facebook ought to have this kind of power. The Massachusetts senator called for Facebook to be broken up, arguing social media giants are crushing competition. And in the case of Facebook, she says, they're acting bigger than government. Facebook's oversight board that made the decision to continue the Trump ban has been nicknamed the Supreme Court. Warren told Yahoo Finance that nickname reveals an arrogant attitude. She said, I miss the part where those people had hearings in front of Congress and were voted on before they were made decision makers with this kind of authority. One of the members of the oversight board itself criticized its decision to suspend Trump indefinitely. Board member Michael McConnell told Fox News the oversight board considered the ban justified. But he said the indefinite suspension was wrong because Facebook did not give a reason for it. The House Republican leader commented on the move in a tweet last Wednesday. Congressman Kevin McCarthy wrote, Facebook is more interested in acting like a Democrat super PAC than a platform for free speech and open debate. If they can ban President Trump, all conservative voices could be next. Facebook, Twitter, Google, and Amazon are facing backlash for their decision to ban Trump. Some critics include German Councillor Merkel and Mexican President López Obrador. In the meantime, Trump communicates with people across the globe in a blog form. His new communications platform, called From the Desk of Donald J. Trump, publishes his latest statements. A bipartisan group of attorneys general are speaking out against social media for children. They joined together to ask Facebook to drop plans to make Instagram for kids. NTD's Christina Kim has more. A bipartisan group of 44 attorneys general are saying no to Instagram for kids. Children under the age of 13 are technically not allowed to join Instagram, one of social media's most popular platforms. But in March, Facebook, which owns Instagram, said it would be exploring a parent-controlled experience on Instagram for kids under 13. Now, the attorneys general wrote a letter urging CEO Mark Zuckerberg to drop these plans. They list three main reasons why they think it's a bad idea. First, they say research shows that social media can harm the physical, emotional, and well-being of children. The attorneys general say Instagram exploits children's fear of missing out and their desire to be approved by their peers. Second, children aren't equipped to deal with the challenges of having an Instagram account, and they don't have a developed understanding of privacy. And third, the letter says Facebook has a record of failing to protect the safety and privacy of children, 
although Facebook claims otherwise. The AGs point to Facebook's Messenger for Kids app, which had a design flaw that let kids chat with strangers without parents' approval. Facebook said Instagram for Kids would give parents more control over their children's online activity for children who are already on the internet anyway. The group also said it's committed to not show ads. Christina Kim, NTD News. New guidance from U.S. health authorities means more Americans are now able to go out unmasked. But some say they aren't yet ready to do that. The masks that became ubiquitous with American life amid the pandemic might soon give way to more smiling faces. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control says those fully vaccinated against the novel coronavirus need not mask up outdoors in most cases. But in Washington, D.C.'s Capitol Hill neighborhood, Anita Gluck isn't yet ready to fully let go. So I carry a mask, I wear a mask when I see another person so that that person won't be afraid of me and won't be afraid of getting infected and doesn't have to think, oh, is she vaccinated, whatever. This week, many Americans have tentatively started taking off their masks. And in Washington and other densely populated areas which issued mask mandates, the change is going to take some getting used to. A.J. Barber is a student from Ohio. I'm like, it feels weird that you feel naked if you don't go start your mask on. So, I mean, it's different, but I mean, I'm still going to wear my mask most of the time. So, yeah. Since nearly the beginning of the pandemic, public health officials have drilled into Americans the message that mask wearing protects them and others from COVID-19. Now, with mandates beginning to ebb, some are trying to move past that symbol of the pandemic. Mark Grace is retired and doing lawn work without a face covering. Like a year ago, it was uncomfortable to wear a mask, and now it's become habit. It's become uncomfortable to not wear a mask. So I want to break myself of that habit and just project an image of normality. First time candidate Glenn Youngkin is nominated by Republicans in Virginia's gubernatorial race. The 54 year old investor defeated seven other candidates. Youngkin has touted his outsider status. He was said his real-world business experience will help him lead Virginia if he's chosen by voters in November. His policy stances include opposition to critical race theory in schools and fighting big tech companies that censor conservatives. Democrats wasted no time in attacking Youngkin. A former Virginia governor called him a Trump loyalist who'll stop at nothing to advance the GOP's extreme agenda. The chairwoman of the Virginia Democratic Party says Republicans nominated a far-right extremist who has demonstrated total allegiance to Donald Trump. But Republicans say Youngkin brings an outsider's perspective to fix a state damaged by years of Democratic rule. Armed protesters in Portland blocked traffic, smashed car windows, slashed tires, and attacked a man, leaving him hospitalized on Thursday. The attacks happened in the riot-plagued city in broad daylight. NTD's Grace Coulter has the details. 53-year-old veteran Joe Hall is recovering from serious injuries after being attacked by a group of armed protesters in Portland Thursday. Here he is describing his injuries to Fox 12. Partially collapsed left lung, two um, lower vertebrae uh, fractured. Along with broken ribs, a broken collarbone, a dislocated shoulder, and head trauma. The incident was captured in this video taken by one of the protesters. Hall had strayed into the Justice for Patrick Kimmons march, held weekly to protest the 2018 police shooting of Kimmons. The group is likely connected to Portland's Black Lives Matter and Antifa network. Hall said he came across the march accidentally. As can be seen in this video, the two cars leading the march, both with their license plates either removed or covered, obstruct Hall's truck. Armed protesters then approach his truck, Here's Hall from his hospital bed, describing to Fox 12 what happened next. All of a sudden, this, you know, these agitators come out, screaming, pounding on my truck. Hall told the Oregonian he grabbed a non-lethal handgun that shoots hard pellets to try to get the armed protesters to move out of his way. Nazi! Here, the protesters can be heard yelling at Hall to drop his gun and calling him a Nazi. Paul said that when he tried to drive around the group, he stopped and got out because he thought he hit something with his vehicle, as seen in this video. By this time, I've got five people surrounding my vehicle, AR-15s, AK-47s. I pulled my 38 out of my right pocket and pointed it at the ground and told them if a weapon points at me again, I will shoot to eliminate the threat. Hall said someone tackled him to the ground and grabbed his pistol before the group started kicking and hitting him. 
A witness told the Fox affiliate that it looked like he was face down and people were kneeling on top of him. In this video, Hall can be heard asking the protesters to call an ambulance after they beat him, but they respond saying he doesn't need one. This wasn't the only assault that happened in Portland on Thursday. This video posted online, also taken by one of the protesters, shows the same group marching at an intersection. Here you can see a vehicle being stopped after the driver attempted to drive through the march. The agitators smash the person's back window, slash the car's tires, and hold the driver at gunpoint. NTD News has contacted the Portland Police Bureau for comment, but they didn't get back to us before airtime. Hall told Fox 12 that he's leaving Portland for good. He said he's shutting his business down and will likely never return to the city. Grace Coulter, NTD News. A U.S. Ghost Guard ship had a tense encounter near the Persian Gulf on Monday. Pentagon spokesman John Kirby said six Navy vessels were escorting a guided missile submarine, the USS Georgia. In the Strait of Hormuz, Kirby said 13 Iranian Navy fast attack boats approached the U.S. Navy vessels at high speed. They came within about 150 yards. Kirby said the fast boats conducted unsafe and unprofessional maneuvers near the U.S. Navy vessels. First, the U.S. tried all the appropriate and established procedures and ways of communicating. Finally, Kirby said the U.S. Coast Guard cutter Maui fired about 30 warning shots. After the second round, the Iranian fast boats broke contact. Last month, Iran's Navy came within 70 yards of U.S. ships operating in the Persian Gulf, and earlier in April, four Iranian naval ships came within 70 yards of two Coast Guard cutters. Up next, NBC announces it won't broadcast the Golden Globe Awards due to lack of racial diversity among the group that hands out the awards. And a Bill Gates-funded company is releasing genetically modified mosquitoes in the Florida Keys. But critics say residents are now part of the experiment without their consent. All that and more here on NTD News. The organization that hands out the Golden Globe Awards is facing pushback from Hollywood. Netflix, Amazon, and Warner Media distanced themselves from the organization. The group took criticism over what's been called a lack of racial representation in its ranks. Now NBC is refusing to broadcast the Golden Globe ceremony next year. NBC announced on Monday that it will not broadcast the 2022 Golden Globe ceremony after complaints about ethical lapses and lack of diversity among the Hollywood foreign press the group that hands out the annual awards for film and television. Despite plans last week to reform the HFPA to recruit more black members, among other changes over the next 18 months, NBC released a statement Monday that the reforms were not quick enough. The move follows an investigation published in February by the Los Angeles Times that noted that there were no black journalists currently in the HFPA. The newspaper also raised long-standing ethical questions over the close relationship between the HFPA and movie studios that may influence the choice of Golden Globe nominees and winners. Actors and actresses have taken a stance. According to Variety and Deadline Hollywood, Tom Cruise joined a revolt led by streaming platforms and studios, returning the three Golden Globe statuettes he won for his roles in Jerry Maguire, Magnolia, and Born on the Fourth of July while Scarlett Johansson on Saturday joined critics including Netflix, Amazon Studios, Warner Media, and dozens of Hollywood's top publicity companies who said they would no longer work with the HFPA unless it made far-reaching changes. The annual Golden Globe ceremony has become one of the biggest Hollywood award shows in the run-up to the Oscars. Genetically modified mosquitoes are being released in the Florida Keys. It's the first time the mosquitoes have been used in the U.S., some residents say they're concerned about possible impacts. Genetically modified mosquitoes will be experimentally released in six locations in the Florida Keys. The plan is to introduce non-biting male mosquitoes that have a gene that kills female offspring. The plan aims to drastically reduce the mosquito population. And after a week or two, our non-biting male mosquitoes begin to emerge. UK-based biotech firm Oxitec created the mosquitoes. The company is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It's the first time the mosquitoes will be released in the U.S. Oxitec is running the experiment in conjunction with the Florida Keys Mosquito Control District. The company says the method has been successful in other countries. The modified mosquitoes emit a fluorescent glow so they can be easily identified and studied. 
And we have this small paddle, and the Aedes aegypti mosquito, the female, she lays her eggs here, and that's how we monitor for the project. Barry Ray heads the Florida Keys Environmental Coalition. He says the permitting process was politicized and the plan hasn't been studied enough. Now we're faced with a technology that has been approved for experimentation on our community. And it has a lot of very significant unknowns. Ray says the people in the Florida Keys are part of the experiment and they didn't agree to it. Because how else are you going to produce your mosquitoes if it weren't for the people in the Keys donating their blood to those mosquitoes that will produce the eggs that you're going to monitor. Andrea Leal is the executive director of Florida Keys Mosquito Control District. She says they're targeting one invasive mosquito species that only makes up 4% of the population, but is responsible for nearly all mosquito-borne disease. She says the species is becoming resistant to their control methods and they need to try something else. Um, so we want to make sure that as we're moving forward, we're looking at these new technologies. Um, nothing out there is a silver bullet. Um, we're looking to integrate whatever we can into our current control methods. About 12,000 genetically modified mosquitoes will be initially released. If the experiment is deemed a success, 20 million more will be released later in the year. New York State continues to vaccinate its residents. Officials believe it's the key to returning to normalcy. Now, getting a shot is mandatory for one group of people. NTD's Arian Pastar has the story. If you want to go to a public college in New York, like this one for example, you have to be vaccinated. The governor announced a new rule on Monday. It's going to apply to new students as well as to those who already attend one of those schools. And he's also pushing for private schools to make vaccines mandatory. According to the CDC, less than 1% of people under 24 who tested positive for the virus had to be admitted to an ICU. But some point out that vaccination for young adults is still important because they can pass it on to more vulnerable people. And while the governor doesn't allow unvaccinated people into public colleges, he's proposing a law that forbids discrimination against vaccinated people. We can't be in a situation where we're full-throated encouraging people to get a vaccine and then have people saying if you get a vaccine you can't participate in this activity. Additionally, eight vaccination sites are going to open at public transportation stations across New York City. You get a free seven-day metro card for everyone vaccinated at a subway station the governor says he understands anti-vaccination arguments, but according to him, those arguments are not based on science or facts, but are based on opinion. Arian Pastar, NTD News, New York. A NASA spacecraft began its two-year journey back to Earth on Monday. Scientists believe it's carrying a special payload, samples collected from an asteroid. NASA's OSIRIS-REx spacecraft is attempting to complete an important mission. That's to visit a near-Earth asteroid survey its surface, collect a sample, and deliver it back to Earth. Its latest move lets staff celebrate at the OSIRIS-REx control room in Colorado. The space vehicle recently completed a rocket burn, pushing it away from the asteroid and toward Earth. The spacecraft arrived at the asteroid, called Bennu, in 2018. The trip back to Earth will take about two years. Once it arrives, the spacecraft will eject a capsule containing the asteroid samples. NASA says it will land on a remote area of Utah. The samples will be distributed to research laboratories worldwide, but 75% of them are reserved for future generations to study with technology not yet created. Just ahead, the National Transportation Safety Board investigates a Tesla crash in suburban Houston. The accident reviews safety concerns about the vehicle's driver assist systems. Researchers are planting mushrooms in a burnt area of California. Why? They say mushrooms can act as a biofilter against ash chemicals, as well as lower temperatures to reduce fires. Find out more in just a moment.
In uncertain times, people rush to buy physical gold and silver. It's strong, solid, dependable. Now is the time to buy from the trusted source, Westminster Mint. With 20 years experience and A-plus BBB rating and our unconditional 30-day money-back guarantee, Westminster Mint is America's dealer. The best value in gold coins today is this newly released 2021 $50 American Gold Eagle coin, certified a perfect 70 by the world's largest grading service, NGC. At one full ounce of pure gold, this 2021 Gold Eagle is the biggest and most beautiful coin struck for circulation. Get yours now while you can at our exclusive low price. Call right now and get the Gold Eagle's perfect companion, the 2021 Silver Eagle, absolutely free with your purchase. With free shipping and a 30-day money-back guarantee, Westminster Mint is America's dealer. Hurry for your early release 2021 American Gold Eagle and free Silver Eagle before they're gone. Call now. I don't remember how it started. Not today. Oh boy. Our back and forth. It always came back. You probably don't remember what you told me. That was perfect. But I heard every word. Police in Houston, Texas are on a tiger hunt, but they've arrested the animal's owner, Victor Cuevas. Authorities were notified about a Bengal that was seen walking around a house. I believe a next door app notice went out and an off-duty deputy came to the house and confronted the uh, owner of the tiger. There's a brief confrontation uh, about the tiger being out in public, which is against city ordinance to have a tiger here in the city of Houston. The uh, owner of the tiger took the tiger back in to the residence. When HPD showed up, they, uh, the owner put the tiger in a white SUV and drove off from the scene. There was a brief pursuit and the, uh, the man got away with the tiger. When police arrived, the owner fled the scene. Authorities say the man is out on bond for a murder charge, which could now be revoked. Cuevas was charged with evading arrest. U.S. safety officials are investigating the cause of Tesla Model S crash. The accident killed two men in Texas last month. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the story. Officials from the National Transportation Safety Board released related information on Monday. They say testing suggests the car's automated steering system wasn't available where the accident occurred, but the car's cruise control function could still have been in operation. The NTSB report drew no conclusions about the cause and circumstances of the deadly crash. Both the driver and his passenger died on April 17th in suburban Houston. The NTSB and local police are still investigating. Police have said they believed no one was in the driver's seat at the time of the crash, raising questions about Tesla's driver assistance systems. But the NTSB said home security cameras showed the owner entering the driver's seat and the passenger entering the front passenger seat. The accident has brought the safety of Tesla's autopilot system into question. Elon Musk said last month autopilot could not have been engaged in the vehicle involved in the Texas crash. Tesla stock fell more than 6% on Monday, closing at just under $630 per share. The NTSB report clarifies that autopilot actually involves two systems. One is a traffic-aware cruise control that controls the vehicle's speed and distance from vehicles up ahead. The second is auto steer, which governs lateral steering movements. Both must be engaged for autopilot to be considered in operation. NTSB said its tests on a similar car at the crash location showed that traffic-aware cruise control could be engaged, but that auto steer was not available on that part of the road. Auto steer assists within clearly marked lanes and is not always available. Tesla says on its website it plans an upcoming auto steer release for use on city streets. Tesla says traffic-aware cruise control matches a car's speed to surrounding traffic while auto steer assists in steering. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. The California governor extends a drought emergency declaration to most of California. This amid what he called acute water supply shortages in northern and central parts of the state. The drought declaration now includes a total of 41 of California's 58 counties. It covers around 30% of the state's 40 million residents. An earlier emergency declaration covered two counties north of San Francisco. 
Governor Gavin Newsom directed the state's water board to consider changing some rules for reservoir releases and to take other conservation measures. He hopes to keep more water upstream. He did not issue any mandatory drought conservation measures, but he did urge residents to limit their water use. The Sacramento Bee reports that California's National Resources Secretary said mandatory orders could be an option depending on the water resource outlook for next winter. Mushrooms. They can be tasty, they can be poisonous, and they can even protect you from wildfires. California researchers are planting mushrooms in burned areas to protect the soil and water. NTD's David Lamb has the details. California saw devastating wildfires in 2020, so now researchers in Santa Cruz are finding ways to reduce the aftermath with mushrooms. The nonprofit Co Renewal organized the study last year. Director Maya Elson says it's all to prevent toxic chemicals from burned houses from seeping into waterways. Teams of scientists and volunteers visit burned sites to plant mushrooms around the perimeter where structures once stood. They install the mushrooms in tubes known as mycowattle. Yeah, well, could you talk about the maintenance behind it and how long did they last, you know, unattended? Yeah, so we check on these every month, but um, they can last for quite a while without much um, happening to them. Elson says they have five more test sites in California. Yeah, so a mushroom itself is actually just the fruiting body of this stuff that's called mycelium, which is a filamentous network that we usually don't get to see because it's underground. These long mushroom-filled tubes can help filter and break down toxic debris and ash particles. Wildfires in California have reportedly reached above 375 degrees, hot enough to melt cars. Co Renewal hopes the tubing efforts will retain more water in the soil, limiting the spread of future wildfires. David Lamb, NTD News, California. Bad news for Facebook. It looks like a majority of iPhone users approve of a new security feature from Apple. The report by Flurry Analytics found that up to 96% of all iPhone users in the U.S. have taken advantage of a new software option. It blocks apps from tracking their online activities. 88% of Apple users around the world have done the same. Apple added its app tracking transparency feature to its iOS with the latest update. Facebook criticized the move, stating it would hurt businesses that used information from tracking to create targeted advertisements. Coming up, Beijing says Chinese clergymen must fully embrace the leadership of the Communist Party. New regulations on religion also ask them to practice socialism. And different districts in Shanghai, China are competing with each other for the highest vaccination rate. They are willing to go so far as paying people to get inoculated. Stay tuned for more on NTD News. The Chinese regime is rolling out new regulations for clergymen in the country. This after authorities arrested a preacher from Beijing's largest house Christian church. NTD's Tiffany Meyer has more on the story. Beijing's crackdown on religion isn't letting up. Local police reportedly arrested a Christian preacher from Beijing's Zion Church last week. Her name is Huang Chunzhi. Rumors say she'll be detained for 10 days. But the information isn't confirmed. The police didn't inform Huang's family that she was taken into custody. When her family later called the police, officers refused to explain why they detained her. The timing of Huang's arrest has also spurred on other questions. She was taken while the Zion Church was occupied with a separate issue, rescuing another of its preachers. Police had apprehended preacher Xi Jiafu in the middle of the night just days before. They later informed his wife he would be detained for 10 days. That's over what authorities called illegal gathering charges. Zion Church is the largest Christian house church in Beijing. But the situation isn't limited to Beijing. In South China's Guizhou province, one preacher has been the focus of a crackdown since March. Zhang Chunlei is an elder member of Guiyang Zhenai Orthodox Church, but he's now in criminal detention for what authorities are calling suspected fraud. His sentence was announced at the beginning of May, after he endured nearly 50 days of administrative detention. His lawyer calls the accusation ridiculous because Zhang's church does not host any activities related to money. Beijing's updated regulations on clergymen are more rigid than ever before. 
They expressly state that clergymen shall embrace the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party and shall practice core values of socialism and practice the sinicization of religions. Just a day after the new regulations came into effect, some preachers reportedly started talking about the original intentions of being a Communist Party cadre in church. The regulations officially came into effect on May 1st. Many from religious communities are strongly opposed to them. Communities in Shanghai, China, are urging people to get vaccinated, promising money and coupons as compensation. But some are questioning their motives, as they reportedly have quotas to fill. Here are more details. Beijing is pushing for mass vaccinations, but what should be an effort to improve public health is prompting questions about ulterior motives. Some have said China's vaccination numbers have become measuring tools used to judge local authorities' job performance. It's caused chaos, as many in China still question the safety of Chinese-made vaccines. And the situation seems to get even stranger in Shanghai, China's largest megacity. Later last month, Post on social media announced a competition between vaccination staff in different regions of the city. Even vaccination stations located inside the same communities were asked to compete for the highest number of vaccinations. A related notice is circulating in Shanghai's Putua district. It says groups from another district, Baoshan, were driving buses full of Putua residents into Baoshan communities to get vaccinated. But it didn't stop there. They even offered a $50 reward for each person willing to go. The notice also added, If you see this type of situation, please immediately call the police. On top of the Baoshan district stealing vaccine patients from other districts, communities inside the Baoshan district are also competing with each other. One netizen described an example of this online. He talked about his friend, who was at first meant to receive the vaccine from his company. But instead, a bus came and took them to a different station in Luodian. What's more, a Shanghai resident told us that people in her area are paid to get the vaccine. If you take the vaccine as a member from our company, we will pay you $80. If you take the vaccine using my ID, I will pay you a certain amount. It's like this. Miss Lee also described another practice, schools vaccinating students without notifying their parents. These poor kids, they don't know to fight back and can only listen to their teachers. Teachers say it's all right and notify parents only after they give students the shot. Another Shanghai local says in order to meet their vaccination quotas, community staff members have to compete for vaccine patients. They may try all sorts of ways to attract people in order to meet their quota. I heard some give out free eggs and give out all kinds of coupons. The situation has become so crazed that Mr. Zhang told the Epoch Times that the vaccination quota has become political. He described a recent conversation he had with a local policeman. The policemen, those insiders, vaccination is a political mission for them. They have to take it. Policemen and public servants, these people are forced to take the vaccine. But the chaos has sparked doubt over the safety of the vaccines. Some have suggested the regime's huge push for Chinese vaccines may reflect quality problems. Beijing appears to be tightening its leash on Hong Kong's press freedoms as acts of violence against independent media outlets increase in the region. Entity's Juliet Song has more. A woman was attacked with a softball bat outside her Hong Kong apartment building on Tuesday. She's a reporter with the Epoch Times, a U.S.-based newspaper with operations around the globe. Sarah Liang works for the outlet's Hong Kong branch, one of the few independent news outlets in the city. She's also done guest reporting for NTD. The Epoch Times Hong Kong edition is known for its uncensored China coverage. That includes corruption and human rights abuses of the communist regime. The publication is banned in China. A man beat Liang more than 10 times with a softball bat, then fled. She was hospitalized and suffers bruises on both her legs. The director of Epoch Times Hong Kong edition says she believes the Chinese regime is behind the attack and that the move is an effort to intimidate the Epoch Times into abandoning its Hong Kong operations. It comes after an attack on the paper's printing press in Hong Kong. Just last month, four men broke into the paper's premises and smashed machines and computers. The facility has also suffered four similar attacks in recent years. The paper says recently more unidentified people and vehicles have been spotted near the facility. The news outlet is calling on the international community not to turn a blind eye to such attacks, but to recognize them as signs of an increasingly worrying crackdown on Hong Kong's press freedoms. Juliet Song, NTD News. 
Still to come, a French court throws out a lawsuit by a journalist who sought to sue companies that produced Agent Orange. The substance was used by American military during the Vietnam War. Rescuers put a stranded whale calf down. The calf was injured and without its mother. It wasn't able to make its way to the ocean despite help. All that and more here on NTD News. If you're like most of us, you're probably getting fed up with the nonsense that's going on in the banking system. Did you know that top U.S. banks have recently amended their depositor terms and conditions to include the words bank failure? And what's required of you in 24 hours if, or should I say when, it happens? Don't get blindsided by your bank. Call GSI Exchange today to pick up your complimentary copy of the Bank Failure Survival Guide at 866 424 2382. We'll also send you the required format to file with your bank within 24 hours of their failure, which is now required by the top banks to avoid freezing of your funds. Yes, the top banks can now freeze your money. The world is in a strange place and banks are constantly changing the rules. So stay on top of the current events that really matter by calling GSI Exchange and requesting your free guide at 866-424-2382. We can't control political volatility, inflation, massive government debt, or the wild swings of the stock market. But we can control where we put our money. Gold is easily outperforming the stock market the last 20 years. Protect your money. Buy gold. For your free direct bullion guide to buying gold, call 1-800-757-7050. During the 2008 recession, Americans lost over $2 trillion from their 401ks. For many people, retirement was no longer an option. But do you know what tried and true investment nearly doubled its value following the recession? Gold. Protect your money. Buy gold. For your free direct bullion guide to buying gold, call 1-800-757-7050. Start your collection today. A Vietnamese woman who moved to France after the Vietnam War says she was exposed to Agent Orange. She sued American chemical companies for her medical condition that may have resulted from exposure. A French court has now dismissed the case, but the woman says she'll appeal. A French court has thrown out a lawsuit by a French Vietnamese woman against more than a dozen multinational companies that produced and sold the toxic herbicide called Agent Orange used by American forces during the Vietnam War a chemical that has long been alleged to be connected to poisoning and deformities in Vietnam and disturbing footage which will follow. The case, filed in 2014, pitched 79-year-old Tran Thu Nha against 14 chemical firms, including Dow Chemical and Monsanto, which is now owned by Bayer. Tran worked as a journalist and activist in Vietnam in her 20s, and says she suffers from the effects of exposure to Agent Orange, including type 2 diabetes and a rare insulin allergy. The multinationals had argued they could not be held responsible for how the US military used their products. Local media reported the court ruled it did not have jurisdiction to judge a case involving the US government's wartime actions. Tranto now told Reuters she would appeal. Millions of gallons of Agent Orange was dropped during the war to defoliate jungles and destroy Viet Cong crops. The US government has maintained there is no proven link between the spraying and the claims of poisoning, although American veterans have won compensation in other cases. Talk about a big whoops. A Belgian farmer nearly caused a diplomatic incident in Europe by moving a single stone. Officials believe the farmer moved a stone on his land in the town of Erkeline to a more convenient spot. But the stone he moved is one of the markers that set the border between France and Belgium. They were placed there in 1819 after Napoleon's defeat. With this small change, the farmer added about 1,000 square meters of French land to Belgium. That's about a quarter of an acre. Luckily, French and Belgium officials saw the humor in the situation. The town's mayor says they'll put the stone back and the border back to where it belongs. 
A beached whale had to be put down in the UK on Monday. Rescuers did all they could to return it to the wild, but ultimately decided to put it down in the whale's best interests. Take a look. A whale calf which got stranded in London's River Thames was put down on Monday after its condition deteriorated and the hopes for its survival faded. The mink whale was first spotted on Sunday night at Richmond Lock in southwest London, where it became beached on concrete. Rescuers worked for hours to refloat it and then towed it a mile downstream. They hoped it would make its way to the ocean, but it was later spotted by Reuters, swimming several miles upstream. When it became stuck again, rescuers decided the best thing to do would be to end its suffering and put it to sleep. The size of the whale, estimated at around 15 feet, suggested that it was still maternally dependent. There was no sign of its mother, and it was in poor nutritional health. It's very rare for whales to come into the River Thames. The Port Authority says the calf would have come from the North Sea, the divide between Great Britain and Norway. A special diamond is soon going under the auction hammer. It's part of a jewelry sale in Geneva later this month. Weighing over 100 carats, the stone is estimated to sell for almost $20 million. Giant, flawless, almost perfect. This is the Alrosa Spectacle, a Type 2A diamond to be auctioned in a Geneva jewelry sale this Wednesday. It's the largest ever cut gemstone in Russia. This fantastic 100 carat uh, decolored diamond was cut from a rough that weighed more than 200 carat. It was called the Sergei Diaghilev, the Sergei Diaghilev uh, rough diamond, and it was mined in 2016. According to a specialist from Christie's Auction House, it took one year and eight months to cut into this perfect stone. This item is one of nearly 150 lots on offer in the sale. The specialist says although the pool of buyers for such a significant item is not as large as for many smaller value jewels, she's still optimistic. Um, we have noticed in this uh, COVID time since 2019 that actually uh, buyers were interested in these kind of high uh, jewelry, uh, high jewels, and so we are confident that this will be a fantastic sale. The diamond is expected to fetch between 12 and 18 million Swiss francs, an estimated 20 million dollars. And soon we look at one mom's miraculous story. Her son's birth left doctors perplexed as he struggled to gain weight. That in just a moment here on NTD News. Every year, millions of mothers face one of life's greatest difficulties, giving birth to unhealthy babies. Tonight, one mother of eight shares her miraculous family story of overcoming her son's illness. NTD's Sapphire Quarter has the story. As a stay-at-home mother of eight, Brooke Tillman knows the challenges that come with being a mom. I think lunch was good, y'all. She's wearing it, too. One of the greatest challenges she faced was that after her son, Hosea, was born, every time he would eat, he would inhale milk into his lungs. It was a traumatic thing for me. It got to the point where my husband took over feedings because I felt as such a failure as a mother that I could not feed my child. At the time, the doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong and why he wasn't gaining weight. Eventually, they did a swallow study that revealed the problem with her son's eating. They had really never seen anything quite like Hosea and his struggles and the way that he aspirated and, and literally didn't understand why he wasn't sicker than he was. Um, I believe that the Lord healed him. Tillman says she and a speech therapist fed him very liquid food. They never thought it could heal him. However, her son began to be able to drink thicker and thicker food until he was able to start eating. Tillman says the experience made her a better person. All those moms out there that have a child that struggles, you don't have a choice to quit. There, that isn't an option. You have to just face it head on and find your inner strength. And I definitely grew as a mother. I definitely grew in my faith. Tillman says her family's faith helped lead her husband, Todd, to win The Voice last year. As for Hosea, Tillman says her son is now such a good eater, they can hardly get him to stop. Sapphire Quarter, NTD News. Real fatigue can affect the quality of your life and may manifest in a number of different ways. Let's take a look at patterns of fatigue according to Chinese medicine. Welcome to Strong Mind and Body, I'm Gina Marie. Some people are so completely exhausted that they have difficulty getting through their day. In Western medicine, fatigue can be caused by a range of health issues. In addition, fatigue can be the side effect of certain medications. 
A Western doctor may have a hard time getting to the bottom of why you are so tired. Chinese medicine, however, may have the answer. Here are some common patterns in Chinese medicine that can be a source of fatigue. Let's start by looking at energy, qi depletion. Energy, also known as qi, powers your body and comes from the food you eat and the air you breathe. This kind of fatigue can arise if you're not eating well, have funky digestion or suffer from lung issues. You may also feel exhausted or short of breath after any kind of exertion, but feel better after resting. Let's look at blood depletion. This pattern can be brought on by a loss of blood, poor diet or chronic illness. It's a common problem among people who have had surgery recently and new mothers. The fatigue associated with this pattern is also worse with any kind of activity or exertion. Sufferers may appear pale and experience eye problems, dizziness or feeling lightheaded and have dry skin, hair or nails. Next let's take a look at yang depletion. People with depleted yang feel a deep and disabling fatigue and some can't even get out of bed. Yang deficient people also feel cold at their core, especially in the winter, and have a hard time warming up and may retain water. Next up is yin depletion. Women going through menopause can experience this. Yin acts like a nourishing coolant, keeping your body moist and keeping the warmth of yang in check. Yin depletion is a kind of odd pattern in that sufferers may feel fatigued yet feel jittery at the same time. It is associated with symptoms such as night sweats, waking or restless sleep, dry skin and a dry or sore throat on waking. Often symptoms are worse with overwork and stress. Next up let's look at liver energy stagnation. This pattern is considered both a blockage and depletion. When there is a blockage of the liver, your digestion is usually affected. The result is that your ability to convert food into energy is hampered. The fatigue will be intermittent. You may feel tired in the morning and actually feel a little better with movement or as the day goes on. Symptoms are usually aggravated by stress or emotional upsets and can cause PMS. Many people with liver stagnation would describe themselves as irritable or depressed. Let's look at accumulation of phlegm or dampness. Dampness occurs when your body doesn't metabolize fluids very well. It's a little bit like a farmer's field that doesn't drain after a heavy rain. When dampness sits around for a while in your body, it congeals and becomes phlegm. People who have phlegm and dampness feel heavy or weighed down. They also tend to have poor digestion or are overweight. And finally, let's take a look at pain. This is also a pattern of both blockage and depletion. Pain acts like a dam in your body, in which the pain is blocking your overall circulation, movement and flow of energy. Because your energy is caught up in the stagnation, you feel tired. Also, dealing with the pain psychologically wipes out your energy. Fatigue can be treated effectively within the framework of Chinese medicine. Under the umbrella of Chinese medicine, your treatment plan may include Chinese food therapy, acupressure, acupuncture, or an herbal formula. Thank you for watching Strong Mind and Body. We'll see you in the next segment. And that's all for now. Catch us again tonight at 6.30 Eastern. I'm Kevin Hogan.
have a new channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube at NTD News. Get the highlights of our news broadcast and the most important headlines that we curate especially for you. Don't miss out on important news. Our videos are being deleted. So if you don't want to be cut off from honest news, take a moment to sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.ntd.com so you don't lose access to NTD. Go to newsletter.ntd.com to sign up for our evening newsletter.